podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the US and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Peyton Greenside. Peyton is the co-founder and CSO at Big Hat Biosciences. Peyton, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah, and it's great to have you come on. For those not aware, we've had uh, your other co-founder, Mark DePristo, on the show. So we're familiar with Big Hat, but this time getting you on to talk about some changes in the business, some success, and what's been going on over the past 12 months. But let's start with yourself, please. Peyton, can you give us a, a bit of a background of your journey in technology from where you got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, and take us up to the formation of Big Cat Bioscience? So my background is actually computational. I uh, did my undergrad in, in applied math and got into biology actually after that and um, have largely been in computational biology and machine learning for now many years, um, working at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as at Google for a bit, besides a longer stint in academia at Stanford. And it was actually at Google where I met my co-founder, Mark Capristo, who, as you mentioned, has been on this podcast. And it was in working with Mark, actually, that a lot of the very first themes of Big Hat kind of came out and kind of were surfaced in our discussions. And it really stemmed, and I think it's, it synergizes well with my own background in the sense of being someone who loves to think about the biology, but at the same time likes to work more with code, with the statistics, with the math and computer science side, where if you are in that computational role, there's increasing power in a lot of the technologies and a lot of the methods that I've been learning and using across my career from, I think, epigenomics to kind of working with the Broad Institute, working more, looking at large-scale gene expression profiling of, of kind of different diseases. And um, now working in protein design and, and they all kind of all computational approaches in the sense that uh, many ways share the same challenge, which is that you're stuck in the data that somebody gives you. But you're not the experimentalist. You are basically at the point of transition where an experimentalist will design, will run an experiment and will kind of hand a data package over to you. And traditionally, the role of, I would say, a computational biologist in many ways is to interpret that data as already produced. And this has been the case throughout my kind of career and gotten to work with a lot of different experimentalists, a lot of different data sets, et cetera, but always as step two. And Mark and I were kind of talking about this and some of our, our work together about why machine learning and other computational approaches were not necessarily seeing the full impact they could from their potential. And this has been growing in my mind and I think many others in the field for a lot of time, which is that ultimately, if you're trapped as an analysis tool, you're fundamentally going to be limited by only getting to work or test your approaches on something that's already been or measured or assessed in the lab. And so you're only going to be able to evaluate or kind of be as creative as something you can really actually look to as already existing. You, how are you going to make something new, right? How, you have to be able to validate it. In many ways, Big Hat came out of my and Mark, our backgrounds collectively of seeing this kind of gap between how do we as computational biologists or computational scientists how do we have the chance to actually get in front, actually, of kind of the lab generation and be able to design something new, especially in the protein case, where you can actually design and make proteins and really test their properties. And so we were really excited about the potential to, I would say, turn the kind of more canonical workflow of how experimentalists, wet and dry lab work together, where they're much more integrated and actually could each participate in kind of both the design, the kind of carrying out and then analysis and then redesign of a biological system. And so all of that to say... In many ways, my background through through many different kind of areas and marks as well led to the founding of Big Hat, where we are really felt strongly about what a next generation lab should look like to enable someone who is computational, who sees a lot of power of these new developed machine learning and other com computational approaches to do something new, but are trapped essentially by kind of the canonical paradigm. And Big Hat was really founded to, to make this lab to allow us to very rapidly iterate between computational design and kind of experimental validation to get out of this kind of fixed data trap. And so that's essentially what we've done. A long way to say that's what we've done. It's been kind of three years now since we founded it in 2019. And we've built the prototype lab. We've now done first proof of concepts, now scaled it up with automation and now hitting kind of many hundreds of antibodies a week. And it's been really exciting and kind of 
you know, going back to your first, the question you asked us to our first goal of being able to have kind of computation be in the driver's seat as much as the experimental side. So Peyton, just taking what you've just touched on there, you talked about the journey from proof of concept to working model to now at scale. I want to spend some time talking about the last 12 months, because since we've had Mark on the show, there's been a lot that's been going on at Big Cat in terms of growth and broader use case. Can you walk us through what the last 12 months have been like and from where you were October 2021 to where you are now, both from a broader adoption of your labs, but also the technology advances that you guys have made? Absolutely. And this has been a very fun and then busy and full 12 months. And there's been a lot of changes, both on the company side. I think most significantly, we raised our Series B and we're able to move into this next phase, which really, to me, and this is the heart of your question, gets into how we go from building and validating and scaling the technology, the platform, to how do we figure out how to deploy that technology to make the most impactful therapeutics we can. And this is the transition that we've been in over the last 12 months. And it's been a very, very exciting one because we're able to take the fact that we can work with these different types of next generation antibodies. We can work with single domain antibodies, kind of multi-specific antibodies. We're making conditionally active antibodies and taking all these antibody conjugates, actually, even most recently, taking all these different types of antibodies and saying, okay, now where do we point this technology? And it, it actually, it's funny, it's, it, it pivots a little bit from a purely technological question, which is what is the blueprint and the philosophy between what you're trying to build around, around the first question we talked about, where Big Hat came from. And now is where are we going, right? How are we deciding which therapeutic programs we should work on? Where is kind of our greatest strength of our platform? Where do we think there's the biggest impact to patients and where the greatest opportunity is? Because it's developing therapeutics, is, it takes quite a long runway. It takes quite a long, many of years to kind of get from roadmap of idea to target ID, target discovery, developing a molecule, moving it through preclinical and clinical development. And it's been really fun because we've been able to now be, I would say, kind of solid enough and grown enough that we're able to start thinking and really putting a lot of effort into our therapeutic portfolio. I guess to break down your question, there's two answers. There's the technical side where we built, where we scaled. And I'm pretty excited to give you a few of those updates. And then the second half is what I was just discussing. It's how are we actually positioning our platform? This is a pretty, pretty exciting position to be able to be in to say, okay, what is the future of Big Hat five to 10 years from now in the sense of what drugs we'll be developing that we think will ultimately make it into, into patients? With that category, on the technical side, we are now running 800 antibodies a week. We are probably a year ago, well below half of that. So it was small hundreds, et cetera. And the level of automation has been really exciting to see scale. On hands off, almost cycles now for up to 800 antibodies a week regularly happening. We're expanding the number of assays in the platform. I think one of the biggest transitions in that plays into kind of who we are is instead of just optimizing for kind of a core property like affinity, most people think of an antibody as a binder and a binder has to have high affinity. But we think about an antibody more holistically, which is an antibody is not just a binder. It's a binder that has to actually execute the right function, which may not even be the tightest binder sometimes. It has to be developable and it has to be stable. It has to be soluble. You have to be able to package it up and ship it around the world and deliver it to patients in very kind of high concentration. And so we think about all those things at once and we're very frequently adding on new assays to the platform. And so, you know, we now have dozens of measurements basically per molecule on the platform, which is at least kind of a doubling from last time and, and especially a focus on functional assays. How do we actually know this antibody is really executing what we want in kind of as close to the therapeutic um, context as we can model? So cell-based assays are really up and running at Big Hat and pretty exciting. Those are some of the technical highlights and that ports itself into if we're doing 800 antibodies a week. Now it's quite exciting for us because to the question I raised around what to do with it, we are not in a position where we have to think and overthink it what one or two things to do. We can work on half a dozen, kind of dozen different projects at a time. And so for us, it becomes in many ways a strategic question. And we've been building a lot of the strategy of how we approach our the deployment of our technical capacity towards different programs. What indications, what diseases, what modalities? We'll, we'll stream work on multi-specifics, on conjugates. We work on tiny little antibodies that can get into cells and localize exactly where you want. And we've been spending a lot of effort to that end. It's really been fun because we're at this now steady state capacity automation, kind of seamless, more engineering scale that, especially with the data management challenges, which you can talk about as well, that pair with that, have allowed us to focus now on especially the therapeutic piece. And it's a pretty exciting transition because that's ultimately where we want to be as a company is making those therapeutic impacts. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions www.aldis.com.
for our audience who are familiar with life sciences and biotechnology, everything what you're saying will make sense. But we have people listen from across all industries and they're always curious for different use case applications of aspects of AI. So whether that's automation, data management, engineering, can you describe some of the unique challenges that you face in, in, in doing what you're doing and how you're utilizing aspects of AI to bring the lab to real life? A lot of our challenges stem from who we are as a company, which is very rapidly cycling between, again, design and validation, design and validation. Unlike a traditional, I would say, approach, which is typically a little bit slower, and you kind of have a nice phase of designing an experiment, you'll maybe design a large set of antibodies and screen those in a kind of typical funnel where you're pulling out just the things that bind, that are developable, et cetera. We are every single week designing hundreds of antibodies and then measuring, as I mentioned, dozens of attributes of those antibodies. And then across half a dozen, growing to a dozen programs. We then have to train model on all of those properties, on all of those different types of molecules and update them every single week. How is the sequence that we have designed turning into a functional attribute, into a different improved affinity, improved stability, et cetera? And the fact that we're generating all this data means we're operating in a very high throughput, high turnaround fashion. And so there's not enough time essentially for everything to be very manual, for someone to look at this output, to manually fit a curve of how is the binding of my antibody changing as I increase the concentration. It all has to be automated. It all has to be streamlined and it has to be organized. And so we've actually developed our own laboratory management system, like LINS, as people call this, in order to be able to track and trace all of the different data through its multiple stages. And there's not just one stage of collecting the data. It's really a lot of stages, getting the data off the instrument, which is in a very different form than a scientist might want to look at. So how do you basically store and kind of label in a very clear fashion? How do you then fit and run basic QC? How do you then turn that into features for your models? How do you then model it? How do you evaluate and all the different sorts of splits? And how are you ensuring that you're being able to benchmark week to week how these models are performing, given that the data set is changing every week? So we have had to think from the ground up of what are the key kind of needs of a data management and tracking system? And for us, it's pretty holistic. It's not just a place to put the data. It's really a way to track our workflows all the way from we know operationally when DNA has been, when an antibody is designed from the kind of the DNA order all the way through the, or synthesis all the way through the protein characterization. When has a model been updated? When is a performance kind of better or worse in terms of what? So it really has to be end to end through this whole design build test cycle. And there's not really anything out there actually that fully supports our needs. And I think many folks in this kind of biology plus technology, biotech or tech bio ecosystem have really run into a similar problem, but we're running into it at a much greater scale because of the speed and the throughput at which we operate and the number of programs and molecules that we service, even with a very small team. So we actually have a pretty sizable, I think, per ratio software engineering team that really is supporting and building out this kind of custom data man management system. And in many ways, that's really one of our, our specialties is thinking from the ground up with how to make this actually a software and engineering problem. The software engineering team works very closely with the experimental side, data science, machine learning, et cetera. And basically, as soon as we can, we turn this into how do we engineer this approach, right? Not how do we make this manual? How do we scale with people? But how do we kind of automate this and, and put every piece of this kind of design build test loop really close together. So it's seamless. So you can get through the loop in 48 hours as opposed to in kind of a month. And so it's been, I guess, one of the biggest and most rewarding challenges to see, especially over the last year, a lot of these come together in a very seamless way that we can scale now beyond the number of people. We're scaling what we're doing at a rate gr greater than the company is growing. And that's really future in many ways is how do we enable that increasing kind of a scale of impact through automation, through engineering with kind of our very small but mighty team. Yeah. So staying on the topic of scale and how it relates to your team, you mentioned there, you, you've got a small but mighty team, which is having a, an order of magnitude higher impact that you would expect per engineer. As you continue to scale, the adoption of the lab grows across various use cases, across all therapeutic areas. What knock-on effect is that going to have to the overall technology team? And with that, if when we're talking to you again, whether it be a year or two years from now, what will the overall uh, technology team look like? How many more engineers are you going to need to bring in? What sort of positions will you need to be hired for? For anyone who's interested in the combination of AI within the sciences field, what opportunities will there be for them to potentially join Big Hat on this journey? That is a great question. In fact, I think the answer to that question is in many ways, following from the trajectory of how we've been built. And 
the answer is increasingly it's engineering roles, data science roles, machine learning roles that pair with our experimental and automation team. So it's actually interesting to think about how we built Big App. When you have this design build test cycle, often people start with each piece of this loop, right? You have experimental, data science, machine learning, software, in equal proportions, I would say. But we actually started maybe with a slightly different model, very heavily based around the data generation, right? The lab, if you can't actually solve the key variable that Mark and I were talking in the early days around like testing your hypotheses, you're going to be limited in many ways. So we really, I think, started out especially looking at kind of the lab. And then stemming from the lab, what happens next, right? You have to basically evaluate and design and kind of QC a lot of the data types that are coming out of the lab. And then machine learning is kind of built on top of that, right? Which is if you if you generate the data, if you can process it, if you can analyze it, extract the value, then you can start to model it. So it, to me, it is kind of a very much a, a pyramid in that sense where machine learning is it sits on top of this foundation of lab and data science. And now we're in a position where th that foundation is strong, it's growing. And so we can start to see basically the composition of the team now vies a lot more towards machine learning, software engineering to help streamline and automate a lot of the process we've done. So it's been really exciting because we have definitely been, I would say, a bit more heavy on the experimental hiring, but it's really getting out of these computational roles that are helping scale the generalizability, the hands-off aspects that allow the platform to scale as we were talking about beyond people that are going to come about to come. So it's going to be a fun opportunity now for a lot of folks who are really interested in these data science, machine learning, and software engineering roles, as well as automation. A lot of those technical, technical roles that where people are really excited about working closely with their counterparts, their very creative, technically minded counterparts in the lab sciences. Peyton, final question from me then, it, talking about the growth and impact and opportunity, assuming you guys continue to be as successful as you've already been, there's going to be lots of opportunities for people who are passionate about data and AI to come and join Big Hat. When you're sat with candidates and you're interviewing them and assessing them, part of it is you're checking for skills and a fit for the business, but you're also promoting Big Hat as a great place to work. When you're speaking to candidates, what is it that you tell them about the environment, the mission, the work that gets them excited enough to join Big Hat over some of the other great opportunities available to them? That is a great question. And I think a lot of it stems from how we operate as a company and we are highly integrative. So what that means is that all of the folks, no matter what area you're in, automation, protein sciences, data science, machine learning, software, people join because they don't want to just work with people who have a similar training, but they very actively want to expand their own expertise and learn basically one to four different other skill areas that they have not had exposure or experience with. And I'm actually pretty proud of the team because we've seen a lot of growth of team members that have come in with a certain background and then actually moved to different backgrounds because they've quickly gotten new skills, they've learned, gotten exposure. So just to be concrete, you know, we've had several team members who started as research associates working in the lab who have then started to learn, how do I work with robotics? How do I think about automation? Can I actually improve my own efficiency by learning a bit of automation and have successfully done that? We've had folks who started from a lab experience who now move into the software engineering world. They're like, you know, I actually like to build out the systems that are tracking kind of as we were talking about before, the data through this workflow from a software perspective, from a data management perspective. And we also have software engineers who come in and they really want to understand from the perspective of what are they trying to build? How do actually lab members and experimental team members view this data? What, what do I actually, how do I interpret this? So we have a very tight knit and very integrative, as I mentioned, team. And I think people, it's not just exposure, it's truly people are like they're learning one, two, three other areas. And if that appeals to you, Big Hat, it could be a great home for you because it's really our kind of our ethos and our culture. And it's been really fun for me also just to be able to see, I think some people joined and weren't even sure what that really meant. And then quickly found themselves just pairing with they're working closely with other team members and finding that just both through very frequent interaction, being able to jointly solve problems that can both have both experimental or computational solutions. It just naturally happens. I think we've seen a lot of people thrive and really expand their own I think professional skill set, as well as just kind of the enjoyment of the job, being able to work so closely with other people. When you have a weekly cycle times, you have a lot of interaction. I think just the way we're built and very quickly, again, switching between lab and computer and back again, it just begets this kind of very close-knit interaction. Hey, thank you so much for coming on today and giving us all the exciting updates around Big Cat Biosciences. For, for anyone who didn't have the privilege of hearing Mark's interview, it's a good timely reminder of great use of AI and how it can revolutionize an industry. It's great to hear that you've taken it from proof of concept to now at scale and continue to scale. Um, we wish you, the team, and everyone at Big Hat the best of luck in, in the year ahead. And we look forward to seeing what you guys can continue to accomplish. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Aldous Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldus.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.